Welcome everyone, I'm Sam Lemley, Curator of Special Collections in Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. So for this episode, I actually wanted to return to a subject that I had visited in an early episode of this series, which is the Posner copy of the American Bill of Rights. And this, is, this video is kind of meant to accompany a blog post that I wrote uh, and published for Constitution Day, which was actually last week. Uh, but I thought it would be valuable to actually record a video to walk through some of the evidence that I treat in that blog post and kind of uh, narrate some of the conclusions that I came to uh, based on the analysis of that evidence. Because um, I think there's something really interesting going on uh, in the Posner copy of the American Bill of Rights and other copies too that survive. So just as a bit of a refresher, um, this copy of the Bill of Rights is part of an addition that was published uh, in the immediate aftermath of the ratification of the Ten Amendments to the Constitution that we recognized as the original um, Bill of Rights. Um, the printing of the edition was actually ordered by Thomas Jefferson, who was then the Secretary of State. And the, obje the objective of this edition was really to have a, an official uh, version of the text of the Bill of Rights to actually distribute um, to the United States, which were then 13 in number. So what happens is Jefferson um, pays for this edition, and actually we have a record of the expenses um, for the office of the Secretary of State showing that he paid for 135 copies uh, of this particular document. Uh, and then there's a letter that survives in his papers, the Secretary of State's papers, uh, which indicates that he distributed two copies um, of this edition to each of the 13 states, basically sending them out um, to the governors of those states. So, um, so that's kind of the historical background. What makes this copy particularly important is that it's incredibly rare. So uh, we now know that only five copies of this particular edition of the Bill of Rights survive. There's of course our copy or the Posner copy, which is at CMU. Um, there's a copy at the American Antiquarian Society. Uh, there's a copy at the Library of Congress. Uh, there's a copy of the Mar at the Maryland State Archives. And there's also another um, privately held copy. Um, so that's five copies in total. Um, so what I wanted to do this year is actually see if I could source digital scans of each of those five copies so I could actually look at them closely to see if there could be any differences between them which might tell us something about how um, this edition was actually printed and made and, and distributed. So, um, so I, I want to just kind of walk through that evidence. So when you look closely at uh, the Maryland State Archives copy, and I'll show an image of that here. And if you put it against or alongside uh, the American Antiquarian Society copy, um, you notice some pretty striking differences. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell uh, you know, on screen here, but uh, you'll notice, if you look closely, that the margins, right, the area around the text in the Maryland State Archives copy, which is on the left, uh, is actually considerably, or they're actually considerably larger than the margins in the American Antiquarian Society. And you might assume that that's a product of these copies being, or the American Antiquarian Society copy being trimmed down to actually reduce the size of the margins, but that's actually not what's happening. This, in fact, reflects the size of the sheets of paper that were used to print um, these two copies. So. That's our first piece of evidence, the paper itself. Um, and to me, when I look at this, this indicates that, okay, some copies of this edition were actually printed on a larger stock of paper. So that's quite interesting. So kind of keep that in mind. That the other difference between these two copies, uh, if you look on the back page, the last page of the Maryland State Archives copy, you see that there is a um, kind of textual typographic um, attestation at the bottom which says deposited among the rolls in the office of the Secretary of State um, and then below that you have um, Secretary of State which is actually printed in kind of a cursive font uh, and Thomas Jefferson is actually signed uh, his name next to that title and that that signature is actually in pen and ink that is in fact Thomas Jefferson's signature now if you compare that with the last page 
of the copy in the American Antiquarian Society, you see that that entire attestation um, is absent. So you miss that phrase, you know, deposited in the, on the rolls of the Office of the Secretary of State, and of course you don't have Jefferson's signature. So um, obviously there's something going on here. There is a pretty profound difference between these two you know, for lack of a better word, like states of this document. Um, and I'll add that the Posner copy, the copy at CMU, actually belongs to the same state as the American Antiquarian Society. So it doesn't have that attestation at the end. It doesn't have Thomas Jefferson's signature and it's on that smaller um, stock of paper. So what I think is going on here, and I explain this in a little bit more detail in the blog post, but what I think is going on is these are two issues, two very dramatically different versions of this document, uh, one of which, the larger copy uh, with Jefferson's signature, uh, was meant to be distributed to the governors. So the, that's, the, that's the copy, that's the version that accompanied Jefferson's um, letter to the governors um, when he distributed them after they were printed. And then there were, there's this other version, this other form without Jefferson's signature on a smaller um, stock of paper that I think, and this is a, a theory of mine, I think they, they were intended for just common distribution, maybe among senators, among Congress people, congressmen um, at the time, or even for sale, right? If you wanted to purchase a copy of the first official printing of the American Bill of Rights, this is this is the version, right, without Jefferson's signature that you could purchase. Now, that's not to say that they were widely distributed. We know, right, from that list of expenses um, from the Office of the Secretary of State that only 135 copies were printed. So my, my theory is that maybe that 35 uh, what were printed on the larger sheet of paper for distribution to the states and the governors and other officials in the government, and 100 copies were printed on the smaller um, sheet um, size for common distribution. That's a theory. Um, the last piece of evidence that I wanted to share, and I was really, really excited to find this, is actually in the, the text itself. So. If you look here, uh, and I'll show again images, oh, kind of highlighting the differences and circling what I want you to look at here. Um, but this is um, on the back of the first leaf. And the image on the top is from that Maryland State Archives copy, right? The larger paper copy with Jefferson's signature. And the one on the bottom is actually from the Posner copy. And you see that the B in Beckley and the O in Otis are damaged. And that's really striking um, to me as, as someone who attends to this kind of bibliographical evidence because types, when they're on the press, were damaged in this way, right? Individual pieces of type, individual letters um, are pieces of metal. And being um, an alloy that was actually quite soft, they could be bent and um, broken and otherwise damaged. So the fact that the B and the O in the Posner copy uh, are damaged while they are undamaged in the MSA or the Maryland State Archives copy suggests to me that the Maryland State Archives copy and presumably all copies on that larger stock of paper were printed before um, the Posner copy, for instance, or the copies on the smaller um, stock of paper because in the intervening you know, polls of the press, that B and O were damaged. So you can see sort of a sequence of production here uh, in kind of the archeological evidence of the type on the page. Um, so that's really, that's really exciting. And I think it's a great demonstration of the kinds of evidence, the kinds of things that I ask students to look for uh, when they come to special collections to look at these kinds of things. Uh, but in any case, it's it's been a long time since I did a coffee with the curator and I thought this would be an excellent opportunity to um, restart the series and to share some of uh, the discoveries that are happening in special collections at Carnegie Mellon. So thank you for joining and hope to uh, have another episode out to you soon.